I'm Dr. Tala. Welcome to Tala Talks NICU. Today, I would like to thank one of our viewers, Anne Shields, for the idea of this video. She recommended we do a video just on random NICU tips. So we gathered up a few and we gathered up some from the unit that we all work in. And so I hope you enjoy it. Tip one is that green amniotic fluid is not always meconium. Babies below 32 weeks don't normally pass meconium in utero at all. And you know these babies take ages passing stool after they're born. So if the amniotic fluid is green, don't automatically assume that it's meconium. It could be either an infection and listeria is notorious to make the amniotic fluid green, or it could be actual bile. So in a situation like a gastroschisis or where there is an atresia where the bile isn't getting swallowed, it could just be going back up into the amniotic fluid. Two, normal newborns will pretty much double their weight at four months and triple their weight at 12 months or one year. So for example, if a newborn was born at three kilos, at four months, that baby would be double the weight, so six kilos. And at about one year, that baby would be triple the weight or nine kilos, um, which is about 20 pounds at a year. Three, if an infant has an intestinal obstruction, the more proximal or higher up that obstruction is, the higher the chance that there will be polyhydramnios in utero. So that's very logical. There's going to be increased amniotic fluid if there isn't enough of the gut to be able to actually absorb the fluid. After the baby's born, the higher the um, obstruction, the higher the chance that the baby's gonna have emesis. If the obstruction is very distal, so for example, it's a colonic or an anal atresia, it's a lot more likely that that infant will present with abdominal distension and just not pooping. Four, for the emesis to be bilious, then the obstruction, whether it's anatomic or whether it's just kind of like an ileus further down, has to be below the level of the duodenum, or more specifically, the bile gets dumped into the duodenum. So if the obstruction is more proximal to the level of where the bile comes out, then you're not gonna have bilious emesis. So for example, if you have an esophageal atresia where the esophagus just stops, or you have like a pyloric stenosis where the uh, muscle at the end of the stomach is kind of like really spasmed and tight, then those babies are not going to be puking green. They're going to be puking up their formula or the secretions from the stomach. The obstruction needs to be below the level of where the bile comes out for the babies to be puking green. Five, a hydrocele, as you all know, is when there is excess fluid in the scrotum. Many babies are born with this and normally it really kind of freaks parents out. In the vast majority of cases, that fluid just kind of gets reabsorbed and the hydrocele goes away. Sometimes though, a hydrocele or excess fluid in the scrotum could indicate that there's actually a connection with the peritoneal cavity. So basically like a really early inguinal hernia where there is kind of a direct connection coming down through the inguinal area and actually directly dumping fluid there. If that is the case, then you have to treat it like an inguinal hernia and that needs to be repaired. And the way you can tell that is if the amount of fluid in, in the scrotum is getting larger and getting smaller, getting larger and getting smaller, then it's much more likely that there is a connection. If it's large at one point because the baby is swollen or after birth, and then it slowly gets smaller and goes away, then you don't have to be concerned about that actually being a genuine inguinal hernia. Six, and this is a tip that one of my kids' pediatricians gave me once, and that is that newborns can eat in ounces up to about half their weight of the baby's weight in pounds. So for example, if the baby is 10 pounds, then the baby after the first few weeks of life is capable of eating up to five ounces at a time. It's kind of just a good rule of thumb for parents. Seven, and this is especially true as we are resuscitating younger and younger babies at the limits of viability. If there is a lot of uncertainty about the gestational age of the baby, then make sure that you are asking the mother's last menstrual period. It is shocking how many times the mother actually knows this and has really never been asked. And obviously a few days here or there makes a huge difference at 21, 22, 23 weeks. Eight, 
Vecuronium does not affect the smooth muscle of the gut. It affects skeletal muscle. So if you have a baby paralyzed on vec for whatever reason, then you can actually still feed that baby because peristalsis can still occur. Nine, umbilical hernias, and you all know what those are, when you can kind of feel like that little gap right underneath the umbilicus, kind of as if the muscle isn't completely formed there. So umbilical hernias need to be repaired by the age of about four. So normally by the time the kids are going to school. The smaller the hernia, the higher the chance of there being an incarceration, which means like a little bit of the intestine gets in and gets trapped in there and the blood supply gets um, cut off and the, that piece of intestine can die. Unbelievably rare with umbil umbilical hernias. But the smaller the hernia, the more you're worried about that. But the larger the hernia, the less likely it's going to just close by itself. But generally, by the age of four, they should all be fixed. Number 10. If the PT and PTT are elevated and the baby is bleeding, then give FFP, fresh frozen plasma. If the PT and PTT are elevated and the fibrinogen is low, then give cryoprecipitate. It's got much higher level of fibrinogen in it. 11. If you have hypocalcemia or hypokalemia, and whether you've been trying to correct it or not, make sure that you check a magnesium level. If the magnesium is low, so really kind of less than two is where you want it. If the magnesium is low, then you have to correct the magnesium level. Otherwise, you'll never be able to get the potassium and the calcium level up. 12. If an infant has an esophageal atresia, so where basically the esophagus just ends in a blind pouch, then you can also know if they've got a tracheoesophageal fistula because there will be air in the stomach. So air in the stomach and the OG stopping way too short means you've got an esophageal atresia with a tracheoesophageal fistula. If there's no air in the stomach, but the OG tube stops kind of right there and you can't pass it further, and the other symptoms of just having loads of excess fluid and everything, then it's just an isolated esophageal atresia or some sort of different connection. 13. If your LFT, so AST and ALT, are in their thousands, so 1,000, 2,000 ish, then it's pretty much either going to be viral in etiology, so like a CMV or a hepatitis or something, or it's going to be um, hypoxic reasons. All the other causes of slightly elevated LFTs generally aren't going to get it to a thousand. 14. An elevated direct or conjugated bilirubin, so really kind of above 0.5 to 1, is always abnormal. Really, we start worrying about it when it's kind of getting 2, 3, and not coming back down again. It is always abnormal. So generally, the first two things that you should do is examine the stool, see if the stool is kind of like a really white, pale colored, which means that none of the bile is coming out, makes you a lot more concerned about like a biliary atresia or something. And the other thing that you should also do almost immediately, apart from the LFTs and any other workup you need to do, is get a abdominal ultrasound and just make sure that there isn't any blockage, that there is a gallbladder there, that the ducts aren't blocked off, that there isn't anything really concerning in the liver. Then you have to go down all the rest of the pathway. 15. High ammonia levels, which you may see in like a urea cycle defect, which is an inborn error of metabolism or other diseases, a high ammonia level can cause a respiratory alkalosis. So just having a high ammonia can make these babies breathe a lot faster and deeper and blow off the CO2. So in a kind of sick looking kid with a randomly low CO2, then think about a high ammonia level. 16. Older fathers are more likely to have offspring with new onset mutations. And a lot of these are autosomal dominant mutations. For example, older fathers are more likely to have a new onset achondroplasia or a spherocytosis. 17, and I think you all know this, Older mothers are more likely to have trisomies. So um, older mothers, especially beyond the age of 35, have an increased risk of having trisomy 21, as well as 13 and 18 are the other two most common trisomies. 18. If at day two of life, a seemingly well-born baby suddenly starts crashing, then first thing, obviously think about sepsis, because we're always worried about that in the NICU. But then also consider these other options. Number one, cardiac, 
did the ductus just close and we need to pop it open with some prostaglandin so it could be cardiac is it an inborn error in metabolism and the baby needs sugar and we have to stop giving all the other stuff that we're giving the baby in the formula number three is it herpes which is also the great pretender of sepsis and number four is it some sort of congenital adrenal hyperplasia crisis so the steroids have just kind of bottomed out and that's what the baby needs so always think kind of beyond the box especially when something happens really suddenly and unexpectedly 19 an IDM baby, an infant of a diabetic mother that has low sugars, is generally going to need a higher GIR, so the a higher concentration of sugar being given to that baby, than a preemie baby or an SGA baby, because the insulin level is so much higher in IDM babies, so they need extra sugar to kind of overcome that insulin. So that's why it's normally the IDM babies that can end up needing GIRs of 14, 15, 16, whereas when you normally admit like a late preterm baby or a SGA baby, normally you're just running them on like a bit of D10 at like 80 an hour and their sugars normalize. 20. If you are concerned about a urinary tract infection or a UTI, then you need to get that urine as sterile as possible. So nearly all the time that involves an in and out calf, like into the urethra up to the bladder, or sometimes we can do a super pubic tap if we're like really desperate to get that urine. If you're not worried about a UTI and you want the urine for another reason, so for example, a drug screen or a CMV test, which is viral, not bacterial, so you're not worried about like the bacterial contamination, or for example, you want to get urine organic acids, then it's okay to have just a diapered bag specimen. 21, if you are going to intubate a baby and the vocal cords are just clamped shut, then I think the most effective way of getting those vocal cords to open is by jiggling the feet aggressively. Very often that will make the baby just kind of take a gasp and the vocal cords will open. Try not to push that tube against the vocal cords, however tempting that might be, because it can damage them. Let the baby open the vocal cords by themselves. 22. If you are worried about a chylus effusion, then you should be even more worried when you send the fluid and there's more than about 85 to 90% lymphocytes in the fluid. Remember, if the baby is not being fed, then that fluid is not going to be milky. So even giving intravenous intralipids is not going to make that fluid milky necessarily. It's only when it's being enterally fed. So you really have to rely on the lymphocytes. So above 85 to 90% lymphocytes is more typical in chylus effusions. 23, when the baby is on INO, inhaled nitric oxide, then make sure that you follow the met hemoglobin level. A normal met hemoglobin level is about up to about two. If it's reaching five or six, then you should probably be changing what you're doing with the INO. If it's really high, like above 10, then you, with, especially if the baby also has lactic acidosis and tissue hypoxemia on top of that, then you really need to be doing something. And the treatment is methylene blue. Number 24. This confuses a lot of people. So this is why I'm putting this in as a point. If the babies are mono-mono or mono-di twins, then by definition, they have to be identical. If the twins are di-di, then they may be fraternal, so which is, means that two eggs were fertilized by two sperms, or it could be a identical situation where the fertilized egg just split really early and both babies ended up with their own placenta and their own amniotic sac. So again, mono-di, mono-mono twins have to be identical. If they're di-di, they may be identical and they may be fraternal. And number 25, if you have sent a blood culture and it comes back positive, then one of the first things that you should do is repeat that blood culture. Whether you're on antibiotics or not on antibiotics, you should hopefully start the antibiotics, but it will give you a much better idea of what's really going on and whether it really was a contamination or not. So if somebody calls, the lab calls at 24 hours and says, we have a positive blood culture, then Look at your antibiotics, change them if necessary, add to them if necessary is the most common thing, and then repeat that blood culture. Okay, that was 25 random tips. We've actually got another one of these videos coming up because we did end up with so many different tips. 
In the meantime, please remember to like this video and to subscribe if you're interested in anything neonatal. And if you have any more tips that you'd like to share with us, then please comment below and include where you're from or just go ahead and send us an email. We thank you so much for being here.